Welcome to Pass It On, Connecting Soul to Soul, a podcast introducing you to courageous souls. These people are taking their spark in life and passing it on, lighting their corner of the world. I'm your host, Tammy Stirr, best-selling author, speaker, and CEO of Author My Day, a company inspiring courage. I interview people about how they exercise their courage muscle and use their story to inspire you to live with a courageous heart. Let's get started with today's guest. Mariel English lives in a small rural community in upstate New York with her husband and two dogs. 17 years ago, they moved from their home in in a Chicago suburb to an old farm. Surrounded by woods and fallow fields, their dogs could run free and explore the property. Fariel spends most of her time outdoors planting and tending to flowers, growing vegetables, and caring for her colonies of bees. The birth of her grandson inspired Fariel to dust off some old ideas and write her first picture book for young children. She feels deeply gratified to now have published a picture book that may delight a child even one she doesn't know well or will never meet. Ferial, welcome to Pass It On, Connecting Soul to Soul. Where are you joining us from today? Well, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. You've been my author coach, and I've just loved getting to know you. So um, and I'm excited to be on your podcast. So I'm um, joining you from my um, farmhouse, <laughs> small old farmhouse in upstate New York. A nice kind of rainy overcast day today <laughs> well you <laughs> so it's good to be indoors <laughs> you make it bright and beautiful for sure oh, thank you. <laughs> so how awesome I, I'm so excited to talk to you because when we were visiting last month I found out a whole lot more about you and I'm like this is a woman of courage oh. that people <laughs> need to meet and of course we're coinciding with also your your book launch so tell us a little bit about the story that I learned about of where you were born, where you have lived, and how you came to the USA. Because I was blown away, literally blown away by your courage to make all these big transitions and life choices. So tell us about this. Well, I guess when you're young, you kind of go wherever your parents take you, you know, <laughs> uh, but you still have to adjust. Um, so I grew up in Pakistan. I was born in Pakistan, grew up in a military family. My father was actually an Air Force pilot. So we moved every year. And it it was tough being a new, the, always the new kid in school, always. And um, I remember asking my mom, you know, how can I make friends? You know, nobody knows me. And when I make a few friends, we move again. Um, so she said, you know, because we had those little side by side desks, somebody would always sit next to me. And she said, you know, just smile and um, be friendly and try to show some interest in the person sitting next to you. And maybe that will help. And it's hard, you know, when you're six, seven, what do you know about showing interest? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have no idea. But uh I still remember that, you know, and just being so confused. But I remember just thinking, oh, you know, well, she's got a nice, you know, ribbon in her hair or just so I I started looking beyond myself at others. And that did help. But I'm just more of a quiet person because of that. Then um, there was just always lots of uh, turmoil in those countries. And so when I was 13, my father actually got a job as a commercial pilot in a small island in the Mediterranean in Malta. And so we left Pakistan and moved. And this was a completely different culture. Um, People were different. I had to learn to speak English. I uh, knew how to read and write, but uh, spoken English was uncomfortable, you know, and just whatever. And then there was yet another school and the, it was a small convent, so at least they were all girls. So I was, you know, took away some of that pressure for a young teen. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, so I learned and we stayed there for a while. Um, and I loved it because I was more independent. Well, we didn't have a car, so I learned how to uh, 
we had to I had to take two buses to get to school, you know, all that. So yeah, a lot of different uh, just learning, always stepping out of my comfort zone. Um, but I had some experience, so you know, just kept moving forward. And then um, it was the British system of education where they really uh, send you either into the arts or the sciences very early on, you know, when you're 17. So I was, uh, my father wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> that didn't work out. <laughs> but so it was biology, chemistry, physics, and math. But I was interested in literature and in languages and in art. So I was just not happy. And um, so it was very generous of my father to say, okay, let's see if you be happy in a different educational system. My aunt lived in Chicago. And she had gone to the University of Chicago and she said, well, you know, I'll keep an eye on her. <laughs> and um, so I applied and uh, I was able to, I was accepted. So then I made the big move by myself. I lived on campus. So from Malta all the way then to the U.S. to Chicago. So, so anyway, then long story short, I'm giving you the, <laughs> the really long. I did meet my husband at, um, so that was another um, hurdle because uh, usually they still um, arrange marriages in uh, my culture. So that was another huge leap out of my comfort yeah. zone. <laughs> Just leaping here, leaping there. But we did, uh, we got married and had our kids raise them in, uh, uh, in the suburb of Chicago. I was working, but then I decided to be a stay-at-home mom. And then eventually... Um, we decided we really needed um, a quieter pace of life. It was just too hectic. Um, so with a lot of just research or whatever, we finally moved. We bought a small farmhouse in upstate New York and made the big move uh, with our two sons. The older one was in university at the time. Um, so he stayed back um because he was um, staying you know was at the university and then we moved with our two younger sons to uh, uh yeah and so it's been great you know just more just learning about all kinds of just a different way of life it's been very absolutely <laughs> so. so as you're sitting here sharing your story first off i want to commend your mother there is a book called how to win friends and influence people yeah Mm -hmm. And the one piece of advice is show interest in the other person and a really good person can leave a conversation and the other person realizes, I don't even know anything about him because <laughs> they were so interested in me. Mm -hmm. And so that was really neat. And I'm sitting here thinking 13, 13, you're transitioning schools, you're learning a new language and you're going through everything that a 13 year old girl goes through anyway. Holy moly. <laughs> Or did you have any type of a coping mechanism or skill that helped you get through kind of like being thrown off the deep end at age 13? Well, see, that's where all the move, prior moves helped because I think without knowing it, I just had developed some self-confidence because I was always adjusting and um, I was quiet. You know, I didn't talk a lot <laughs> because I just didn't didn't know but I listened and um and fortunately you know it was a girls convent so those girls were it was all girls so it wasn't all the you know all the other um uh what would you call it showing off or you know being with the the mean girls or you know because they're all the boys involved so it wasn't that and it was still a very close society because they were um it was in the 70s, you know, late mid to late 70s. So they were very Eastern European. So it, it was quiet, you know, everybody went to church on Sundays, then they went to their grandparents for Sunday lunch. Uh, everybody, uh, there were no big department stores, so all, uh, all the women sewed their own clothes. So it was nice, it was a great stepping stone from the East to America, to the West. It was a Again, I didn't know anything, but in retrospect, it was it was a very um, just because it was just a nice uh, conservative, and we came from a very conservative culture, so it 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 helped. And so, just little things, you know, just 
um, and I uh, and the teachers liked me because I was quiet <laughs> and I, very hardworking, didn't create trouble, and uh, you know, so um, I ended up tutoring some of the other girls and some of the math things like that because again, you know, I didn't go out much after I came home. I just studied a lot and helped with you know housework with my mom or whatever. So yeah, so I think it was just uh, just being me, I guess you know, learning from the past. So kudos to your dad for saying you have a brilliant mind. We're going to put you on the sciences path in the British education system. But Ferial, I've seen your art. You are an amazing painter. You're now an author, a writer of beautiful stories, children's books. And I know your brilliant mind has more like, what did you think when your dad said sciences, knowing that you have this amazing talent for art? But see, that was just a hobby. You had to have a career. Because there, you know, I, there were, so girls are, uh, were sent into, you know, again, it was old fashioned, but you either went into teaching or you went into medicine. And uh, boys became medicine, uh, either uh, doctors or engineers. You know, so there were just certain things. And again, we didn't have Google. We couldn't look up well, different careers. You know, we just kind of tried to please our parents because they were paying for our education. And we just, you know, just did. But I just, I didn't like the sight of blood. And I just <laughs> knew, <laughs> I just, I, I tried. They had this little TV show, which they would show, you know, operations and things like that. So I, in Pakistan, so I tried to um, gird myself, you know, and be strong, but I just couldn't, I tried to watch them, you know, and really, it just, it didn't work. So I, I just thought, I, and you didn't know, you know, you, I could have gone into scientific research or, because I did like research, but I had no concept of the types of careers, even in the medical field. And there were no real, I didn't know who to ask, you know, or so I just, uh, I felt terribly guilty, but I just said, you know, it's just, I can't uh, do this. <laughs> and and he saw that I was really losing interest in those subjects because they have the O levels and then they have A levels, then you go to university. And so I was in the A level um, path, but after one year, I just, I, I was, pretty unhappy because I, I, you know, I like geography and history and art and yeah, all that poetry. So when I came here, it was like Christmas, you know, I had that big, uh, you know, the big uh, course catalog and I'm just looking at it. It's like candy. It's, uh, what can I, it's true. I mean, I just uh, did uh, a whole year's worth of uh, uh, European literature then a whole year, because it was a quarter system. So we had three quarters. Then I did, uh, uh, oh, I did a history of science. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, science and medicine from way back when, you know, so just, there were just so many choices. Uh, so it was great. <laughs> There's so much we take for granted growing up mm -hmm. in the U.S. That, that that's great to think about that. Like it's opening up Christmas when you open up this course catalog. But you had a very courageous moment here, and I don't know how it played out, because at some point you're like, oh, I'm going to be in an arranged marriage someday, and now I'm in love with this guy. That's how I have to tell my parents this, who are used to arranged marriage. But do you be willing to share this story, how this went down? It was very scary. Because, you know, because <laughs> I was had to be. too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so the fur, uh, I, I mean, I, I tried, you know, very hard because my aunt had told my parents that, you know, just realize these things can happen. You know, I mean, it, it's just kind of natural. No, we trust her, you know, and I tried, but, you know, but sometimes you just, I mean, we'll be married for 40 years next year. So obviously, you know, some some things you just can't, Say, and I did try, you know, to say, okay, you know, and he couldn't believe people still arrange marriages, you know, because he's <laughs> just from Pennsylvania. <laughs> no concept. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so it was uh, my sister. I told her first because I was back in Malta over the summer. I wasn't able to stay here because I was on a student visa. So 
and she was, you know, kind of lying under her quilt. She said, I don't want to hear anything. <laughs> I said, I'm going to go talk to my mom. So my mother, I'm sure, was kind of shocked, you know, because she really didn't think. But that was still, uh, I mean, now it's much more common because so many kids are here. You know, it's the second, third generation. They're marrying um, people that they care about. But back then it was still very and very difficult. So yeah, I did. And she said, well, it's probably a crush. You'll get over it. I thought, well, I've broached the subject now. I'm just going to retreat. <laughs> and I did try. I mean, I tried to break it off. And it was, you know, it was just, it didn't, didn't work. And then my father just, we, I was taken to his older brother uh, in Pakistan <clears throat> for advice. Like, what are we supposed to do? And then he talked to me a little bit. Then he told them that, you know, if you keep her from marrying this person that she's obviously very serious about and later she's unhappy or, or you will be blamed because you did not let her make this big kind of life decision for herself so you have to be prepared if you are willing to you know take that responsibility if not then it will be her responsibility and if things don't work out well you know, she won't be able to blame you. It would be just something between them. So it was tough for them, you know, but I, uh, they did finally allow me to uh, make my own choice. And uh, it's been good for me, <laughs> you know. So wow. that's how it worked out. <laughs> wow. I, <clears throat> Burial, I just keep listening to these stories over and over and the commitment that you have to your education, to yourself, to your family now. Um, and now you've committed to something bigger. You are releasing a children's book, Charlie and Sophie's Great Escape. Yeah, Tell I us. have it. I got my copy. Yes. So, yeah. so excited. <laughs> well, Tell you. us about your book and why you wanted to write it. Well, um, so it's based on our two week adopted when my youngest son went off to college. It was kind of a empty nester moment. So I decided we had all this room. Um, you know, we had a lot of land and the, uh, so it was, was a good time. I thought that, okay, well, I can do this. And uh, I volunteered at a border collie rescue for a while to learn about the particular breed and how they train them and all that. And then heard that two puppies had come into the rescue. They weren't related, but they were similar in age. Both were about three months old. And uh, because I had been um, volunteering, I had first dibs. So we were able to adopt them both. And just their zest for life, you know, they were just so curious and so intelligent and so present. Um, whenever I took them for walks, it was just, you know, I was just their antics with each other, with me, uh, just made me laugh out loud each day. And I thought, what a gift, you know, how many people are able to literally laugh out loud every day, you know? Um, and I would take pictures and little videos when I came back from a walk or whatever, I take little notes. Because I knew that, I mean, they were puppies, it wouldn't last forever. So uh, I just wanted to really capture my feelings and also, you know, their joy. Um, but then, unfortunately, Charlie, I think it was something to do with his puppy mill origins. He got uh, sick and uh, they were all, you know, we took him to all the uh, specialists, but they couldn't diagnose it. So basically for just four months after the onset of his uh, first uh, symptoms he was so sick um refusing to eat so yeah I mean it was just awful it was something that was just kind of eating him up from inside um so he just uh we had to decide to you know let him go and so eventually I decided because I was just heartbroken I mean he was he was like a little boy he was so intelligent and he would always look at me and kind of you know we talked 
and he knew, you know, because Sophie would get into trouble and then he'd just look at me. He's like, see, see what she's doing? <laughs> I said, I know, but you're a good boy. You're staying here. <laughs> uh, so um, to work through my grief and to keep his memory alive, I decided to start writing, you know, about their little adventures on our property here. So wow. that's that's the yeah the inspiration, and it was a memorial kind of to Charlie. So the illustrations are very, very true to life. So. I I don't know that I knew that background, and we've been working together for a year now, and I had the um, honor to be your author coach, and the fact that we both write about dogs, and I'm finding out. But that's how we both processed our grief. That that's amazing. What what a great connection. I yeah. always know there's some soul to soul connection with um, my yeah. guests, and <laughs> I would have never guessed guessed mm -hmm. <laughs> that that was going to be one of the connections that I definitely felt with you today. So thank you for sharing that. Oh sure. <laughs> so <Yep. laughs> you've undergone tremendous growth this year. Tell us about what you have done to leave your comfort zone and travel this courage road to reach this great goal. And how has this changed your life? <laughs> so as you kind of mentioned earlier, I've been, uh, I'm an artist. I've always been very visual. So, you know, um, painting, photography, quilting, even planting flowers, you know, all the different colors. It's just color, pattern, that kind of stuff. So when I re uh, decided to write about Charlie, that would have been using a different part of my brain um, to paint pictures with words, with language. Now I've read all my life, um, but that was kind of scary to see, can I do this? Um, so I had to learn, you know, I started taking a lot of books, whatever, and learning. And then, but the scary part was sending the, that draft that I thought was finished to our editor. Because then it's something that's very close to your heart. Um, it's within you. Then it comes out onto paper or the computer. And then now it's kind of like your child. You're sending it out into the wide world. <laughs> and now you don't know how it's going to come back and it's going to be changed. And will it still be uh, your voice? And so then, you know, so that was tough um, to, the second big thing was to quiet that critical voice. That's always, you know, is this good enough? Will anybody like it? It's yet another dog's book. How many dog books are out there in the world? You know, I, you know, so, all of those things, so that takes courage to accept. And you helped me with that a lot oh. to that. Well, that it's your voice, right? We are all unique. We are all um, products of our own experiences. Mm -hmm. Nobody's voice is just like our, or our experience. And so, okay, it's another dog book, but so what, right? I mean, it's, Something that I want, I don't I think that I'm going to be, a, you know, selling a million copies, but that was not the, my goal. The goal was to start writing and start that whole new journey. Um, so I think, so that was the main thing to have my own voice and in what I was doing and to just keep moving forward, you know, to uh, still those self-doubts because we are all assailed <laughs> with self-doubts mm -hmm. um right and so you just have to have the faith and the courage to keep stepping out of the comfort zone of feeling safe because when you start something new like this i mean it is not safe anymore because you're putting your innermost <clears throat> thoughts and feelings out into the world to be judged <laughs> and criticized but that's fine too. You know, you can learn, you can learn from those critics and criticisms and be better, uh, become better at what you're doing. So, so that's been the journey, learning social media stuff, which was really tough. Um, learning to deal with my illustrator, 
because uh, you know it's a it's a joint project. You have the manuscript. Your illustrator is translating that into pictures. So the collaboration, uh, learning how to do that. Um, just I mean I'm a very quiet person. I'm happy with my trees, my flowers, my animals. You know, mm -hmm. and to just learn to now communicate with people, to be out there a lot, um, was pretty. Uh, interesting <laughs> you know but it's 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 working i've met a lot of very very good supportive people through miriam so group. So that helps well, talk about good supportive people um so going back your journey of a year ago you were almost non-existent on social media yeah. and now you've built just a great social media platform and on that platform sorry about that dean um, on that platform that you have built, you have been featuring other children's book authors. And I keep thinking about when you asked your mother um, as an elementary student, uh, how do I make friends? And when she said show interest in others, the interest that you have shown in other authors and help support them is a great gift. It is such a great gift. So thank you for including and helping others on their journey, on your own journey. Well, we're all on this road together, you know, and it's not easy. And so if you feel that, that you can maybe, if you're further along, you can lend a helping hand to somebody else who's just starting out, because then you are, again, uh, getting help from somebody who's further along. You know, and so it's it's just nice. It's kind of like a little rope that we're all tied to and just help each other up, you know, up the slope. And why not? Why not? Exactly. Dariel, it's time now for the questions I ask all of my guests. And the first one is, how do you define courage and why does courage matter? Well, I think um, life, living life just takes courage because nobody, uh, ha life is not smooth sailing. You just have things that come up um, in the course of living, whether it happens to you, you know, health related or, um, you know, just changes and you're constantly having to adjust. And if you have a quiet moment, then be grateful <laughs> because something is coming, you know, that's how it is. And especially if you have family, kids, things happen. And so you just have to dig deep, pull out, you know, your courage, whatever you have learned, because others are depending on you or, or they're watching, you know, if you, it depends on how you behave uh, when you're um, faced with some dilemma or some issue. And especially if you have kids, they're watching and they, they need to learn how to deal with things that happen in school, in sports, whatever. And so uh, I think that's very important. And uh, you just have to work on yourself and just realize that everybody is facing something. If not right now, it's going to happen soon. That's just life. And so be kind. Uh, and just build on, build your strength, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so courage really for you is about that inner strength. Yes. And that reflection. Yeah. Because yeah. that helps you, you know. So believe in yourself. Believe in your own voice. Um, still those critical thoughts that keep coming. Because they just pull you down. And that drains the, any courage that you might have built up. People have self-doubts all the time. You know, are we good enough? Is this the right answer? Well, you know, if not, at least try. Try and you learn whether you fail or you succeed somehow. You learn from those experiences and that helps. Okay, at least I was brave enough, strong enough to try this, whatever it was, solution or new step. And if it doesn't work, fine. You know, at least I learned something and I can try something else um, at another time. So just keep moving, I think, and trying new things because it expands your experience. It expands the world you live in. Uh, you can give more, you know, and then when you are in need, hopefully somebody else 
will <laughs> reach out and let you borrow their courage. <laughs> right. Absolutely. What spark do you want to be in the world? Um, I think I'm not sure what what I bring, you think, what I should bring. Is that the spark? Well, I the think spark is like what because of you, what do you want hope changes in the world? Because my next question is going to be kind of looking back at what, um, why is the world better because you're here? So what spark do you want to be like looking forward? Um, I have, I've, you know, realized that life is not simple and it's not easy for anybody, you know, it's just whatever their perspective is. So I, my spark, I would like to be kind and offer acceptance so that that helps if somebody feels listened to and kind of accepted for whoever they are, whatever they're bringing um, to the table, then that I'm hoping will help them open up more about themselves and have enough then faith to reach for their own hopes and dreams. Um, so I, I, I guess because I have met a lot of different people, a lot of young people, and, uh, I think they, there's a need, um, to feel, um, there's too much chaos in this world. There's too much noise, uh, and, um, we get lost, you know, and individuals get lost in the noise. And to find some, to be somebody who offers that a listening ear. Do you matter? You know, you are here. You are an individual. Your existence matters. So tell me, you know, about yourself. I think that's important. So that's my little spark, I guess. <laughs> I, I think that's a pretty big spark. <laughs> that's a big spark when you think about <laughs> that idea of, you being interested in somebody and they lean into their hopes and dreams um, either because of a conversation with you and hopefully from reading your book. Yeah. Or validating so. them, right? It's the validation that you matter. What you're going through is important. And yes, you will get through it. And, and it's important, you know, it's important. I mean, we, have lived a lot maybe so somebody young will think oh you know it's but that's not because for them it's the whole world it's what they're living in right now so anyway <laughs> I think that's important I love that you matter you matter wow mm -hmm. powerful well we'll be better in the world because Fario was here oh <laughs> um well I think I decided to stay and be at home mom. So for me, being there and raising my children was the, the richest, deepest experience of my life. And I gave, I think, the best parts of myself to my kids. So I'm, my hope is that I have, I have sent out well-adjusted, strong, loving, kind, young adults into the world and hope that now they can make positive um, changes, not changes, but positive. Um, like influence? Something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in the lives of others, positive. <laughs> yeah. Effect or, you know, something positive, something that they, they will do to help others based on how they were, you know, raised and what their experiences were. So right. So because That's... it's all ripple effects, right? Every tiny decision, every action you take, um, think about it first because those ripple effects can affect something way down the road that you will never know. But because you were here, and so I hope <laughs> that my ripple effects are positive you know they reflect light as they go go across the surface of the big pond so there's a question I ask when I um do trainings and for it for 4-H volunteers mm -hmm. and I always start with 
how many seeds are in an apple? Usually it's everybody's like, well, it depends on the kind of apple, how many seeds are in the <laughs> right? And yeah. then I say, how many apples are in a seed? Mm-hmm. And a when you start seed. thinking about yeah. that seed growing a tree that grows apples season after season, who has seeds, who grows more trees. And that's that ripple effect. Like you have no idea when or if that apple tree or that seed you planted for the apple tree will ever stop producing Mm -hmm. for generations and will feed generations. And I think that's exactly what you've done by sending um, your children out into the world and what you've tried hard and how to raise them. Mm -hmm. So very neat. What's next? What's next? (laughs) Well, so my book launches on Monday, the 21st of October. So I've been really just focused on that, getting it out. And then uh, I'm looking forward to library events and talking about things at uh, elementary, you know, at schools. And then <clears throat> eventually um, writing my next soon. Are you going to give us even a hint? Like, is it, are Charlie and Sophie in it? Like, will you tell us anything? I don't know yet. I've got a whole notebook full of uh, ideas. So I have a lot of dog stories because then when Charlie died, we did uh, uh, end up adopting another dog. Um, And he was a visitor before because he belonged to my son, but then my son had to move, couldn't keep him. So so it was the cousin who came and never left. (laughs) That's (laughs) lucky. (laughs) So, yeah, so there are encounters with porcupines and just, you know, a whole, just a whole bunch of things. Or else, yeah, there are other ideas um, for life on the farm that we eat because we have all the bees, honeybees and other things. So I don't know yet. That's the exciting kind of thing still to decide which book, which candy to pick. <laughs> right? Open up that course catalog. It's like, open up my yes. idea notebook. <laughs> Yeah. So what do I feel like writing now? <laughs> so right. that'd be fun. Yeah. Oh, is there anything you wish I would have asked you? Um, or that you just, no, I'm just hear? happy we're, no, uh, you, you have, it was a great interview, I think. Um, no, I'm just happy to have met you and uh, hopefully we can kind of keep working together and helping each other on a writing journey. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, No, it's just fun. I mean, you know, just enjoy, I think, be present. You know, that's my message. Just this is all we have is the present. Appreciate it, you know, be present in your life because it goes by so quickly. Um, Just appreciate what you have. You know, don't get too caught up in the chaos. (laughs) Because what can you do, you know, and it just brings you down. So. Even if they don't move from Chicago to upstate New York, find that, how can you get rid of some of that chaos? Bring that simpler um, simpler moment into your life where you can be in it is what I have heard over and over from you. Yeah. So very good. Very, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for yeah. being my guest today. Make sure everybody that you go onto Instagram and follow Ferial and you can see the website link where you can follow her journey her blog it is so neat to see where she's coming and of course you'll want to watch where she's going so go to the links at ferial books.com did i say that right yep and um check her out and of course check out charlie and sophie's great escape <laughs> Everybody, I'm having so excited! A... Yes. <laughs> Just, I can't believe it when this book came in the mail. It's like, wow, it's nice, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for listening and being inspired to exercise your own courage muscle. Please leave us a rating on whatever platform you are listening. For even more, you can go to www.authormyday.com. Remember, you only have this one life, this one day. So always author your day. Thanks for listening to Pass It On, connecting soul to soul.